Whether or not an object can actually be written to an output stream depends on whether or not it's serializable. And the term serializable, as the name would imply, indicates that that particular object can be broken up into a sequence or series of bytes. Now you'll recall the existence of a number of marker interfaces that we talked about earlier. There was clonable and there was comparable and this is yet another marker interface called serializable. So as a marker interface it doesn't have any methods associated with it and that means you don't need to implement any methods but when you say your class implements serializable it's simply marking your class as being able to be broken down and serialized into a sequence of bytes. In other words it means that your object, whatever your object is, can be written out to disk because it has to have that property of being able to be serialized in order for that to happen. And so there are mechanism in Java, mechanisms in Java that automate this process of serializing something and they will only work on things that have been marked as serializable by virtue of them implementing the serializable interface. Many of the pre-existing Java classes that you've learned about are already serializable. For example, all of the wrapper classes for primitives that you've seen can all be serialized. And the array list and the string buffer and string builder, strings themselves, and date, all of those things, well you certainly know that date is serializable because we just did it a moment ago in our previous demo. If you were to attempt to write an object out to disk that was not serializable, then you would generate an exception and that exception would be the not serializable exception. Now sometimes you may have an object but it may have most of it, it can be serialized but there might be something in it or some things in it that are not able to be serialized. In that case then strictly speaking the object cannot be serialized. However there is a workaround. There's a keyword transient which you can use to mark such data fields that aren't serializable uh, so that the GVM or Java Virtual Machine will ignore those fields when attempting to serialize the object to an object stream. And that then functions as a way in which everything that can be serialized in the object will still be able to be serialized. And simply the fields that have been marked as transient uh, will not go for the ride. They will not be stored on the disk as part of the serialized object. So as an example of using the transient keyword, we have a, a particular case here where we've got a class called foo, which is said to implement Java IO serializable, meaning that it should be serializable. But there is a particular data member in it, uh, which in turn is another class, class A. So it's an object V3 of class A, and class A is not serializable. So you'll notice what we've done here is just before where it says a v3 equals new a, we've put the keyword transient in. And now, even though class A is not serializable, because we've indicated with transient that we want to skip this or not serialize it, the rest of the class does become serializable. And we can go ahead and, and write an object of class foo out to disk without any problems. If we didn't do that, then we would get a not serializable exception. If you write an object out to disk using the object output stream and then you write the same object out again, then Java is smart enough to know that there's no need to put two copies of it out into the disk file. So what will happen is that when it's first written out, and this is true for any time you write an object, there'll be a serial number that goes with it. And if you attempt to write the same object a second time to disk, only the serial number will be written. And that, is, of course, can create a huge savings. On the flip side, then, when you're reading objects back in using the input object stream, then what's going to happen is uh, if you encounter a second copy of that object, there will only be the serial number there. And when the serial number is read in, then what will happen is an appropriate reference will be created to the first object that got built from being read in and you'll simply have another reference to that same object in memory. As you know, in Java, arrays might not necessarily be arrays of primitives, but they could be arrays of objects. 
An array then can be serialized provided that whatever objects it has as elements are all able to be serialized. As long as that's the case, an entire array could then be serialized and written out as a uh, object using the right object. And then of course at a later time it could be read back in off of disk using the read object. In the next slide we're going to take a look at an example that actually utilizes this and we aren't going to go into the IDE Eclipse to look at it. We're just going to look at it on the slide and talk our way through the code. So what this demo would do if we ran it is it was is going to declare an array of integers consisting of the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. It's going to also declare an array of three strings, John, Susan, and Kim. And then what we're going to do is write those out as objects. We're going to create an output stream called, uh, using a file name array.dat. And in there we're going to store two separate arrays. One will be the array of integers and the other will be the array of strings. And remember in Java that strings are objects. So that's, this does constitute then an array of objects. And the last two lines of code you see in this slide are actually responsible for, for doing the job of writing those objects out to disk. So in the first case, uh, again, even though it's just an array of primitives, it's treated as an object and written out as an object. And then certainly in the second and last line of code that you see on this slide, we're dealing with strings which are indeed objects. So in fact, we're definitely writing an array of objects out in that case. Continuing on in this slide then, we take that freshly written uh, um, file containing those two objects, an array of integers and an array of strings, and we're now going to read them back in. You'll notice in the declaration section then we've declared an array of unspecified size of new numbers and an array of unspecified size of new strings. At declaration time, at creation time, we're inputting from the file using input.readObject and because, and remember this is important how uh, formatting and order is important. So if when we created the file we wrote an array of integers first and then an array of strings, we better make sure that when we read from the file we start by reading an array of integers first and then an array of strings. And that's what we've done. So we've done it in the correct order so that matches up or aligns with what we did when we created the file. In the next lines of code we simply print off the individual elements to confirm that what we read is in fact what we had written earlier. So there's no great surprises when we, if we were to run that demo, which is why I've decided we'll simply talk through the code rather than demonstrating it. You might want to uh, go ahead and try it on your own and then open that file array.dat in a simple text editor and have a peek at what's there um, just for your interest.